Jennifer is here to discuss a sensitive subject we all need to talk and think about. Jennifer Graziano and Time to Talk. Good morning, Westchester. It's 9 a.m. on Monday, and that means it's time to talk with me, Jen Graziano. I am a licensed funeral director who oversees my family's funeral homes, Cox and Graziano of both the Marinick and Greenwich, and the Zion Memorial Chapel of Westchester. Every Monday, I come to you discussing important topics and sensitive matters that all of us need to pause and reflect upon at some point, and through this show, I hope to provide a platform to do so. It is great to be back in studio and also to be joined on air today with Facebook Live viewers. Thank you, Tim Judge. Great to see you. And if you are listening on air on 1460 WVOX, we'll take questions, comments, and calls to 914-636-0110. So as this push to resume normalcy spreads throughout, um, hopefully people are starting to realize we have to get out of our homes. Um, there's so much that's on our mind. And for so many people, we have been separated from loved ones who need our care. We've had loved ones in hospitals without their family, without their advocates. And it begs the question, who is their voice for all those people who have been infirmed and separated from their caregivers? On the line, I am joined today by an author, an expert who can help us talk a bit about being an advocate, a healthcare advocate, um, or a great care manager for the ones that we love. Her name is Erin Galen, and she is the author of Badass Advocate, a title that struck me, and I'm so excited to speak to her. Welcome, Erin. Hi, how are you, Jen? I am okay. Did I pronounce your name correctly? It's Galleon, but that's okay. Galleon, you know, and I asked an Irishman sitting in here, my Tim the cameraman, so Tim, make note of that, Aaron Galleon. Aaron, thank you for joining us. I told you I was the worst. Yeah, he did disclaim that. He did say he's probably not right about that. So. But Aaron, um, sorry for the mispronunciation, but wonderful to have you on the line. This is a topic I am so passionate about. I believe that you have to be your own advocate in life, be it for anything. You have to be able to stand up for yourself, speak up against what is not right, or if something seems wrong, it probably is. Um, and taking that one step further, we have to advocate for the ones that we love, and especially if we have a family member who is sick. Navigating through doctors and doctor's appointments, um, even getting that set up is challenging. Uh, going through somebody's medication and deciphering what they take at this time or how much they're taking. They're daunting tasks to be a caregiver, and while you're giving care, you still need to be a champion of the person who is sick. You have to be a champion of their cause, and you really have to advocate for what is best for them, and it's not often easy to do. So let's begin with your background and how you came to write this book. Yes. So first, I want to support everything you just said. I agree with it 100%. So what happened was in 2017, my sister Megan was diagnosed with three diseases concomitantly. So she had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and the cancer caused an autoimmune disease, and then the autoimmune disease caused a lung disease called wow. bronchiolitis obliterans. Wow. And ironically, the cancer was the good news because it was curable. She did five months of chemo, and... She did beat the cancer in February of 2018. Unfortunately, because it caused this lung disease, the lung disease was very rare and aggressive. And it just really took its toll on her body, and it quickly, her body quickly deteriorated over a 13-month period. And, you know, it's the one time in life you don't want to be rare is when you have a disease, right? So, oh my unfortunately, goodness. yeah, it's limited information, and... It really just took its toll. So during that time, my family lives in Charleston, South Carolina, and I live in Dallas, Texas. And so I would travel back and forth when I could. I had a young child. But I learned that my knowledge and experience as a pharmaceutical sales trainer really gave me an advantage because I had experiences that other family members who are caregivers or advocates, but they don't have, and knowledge that they don't have. I mean, I train reps how to speak to physicians for a living. So what an advantage I have, right? And that led me to think about how could I help others, even though my sister ended up passing away 
in October of 2018, I was determined to make something so heartbreaking turn, turn into something good. You and really did ch- help channel others. It. Yes. Right, yeah. exactly. Because it is, it is heartbreaking and it's something we'll deal with for the rest of our lives. But I at least want to make, help others, right? And make something good come out of it. And that's the only way I could think of turning the situation around for my life. And Well, it's therapeutic for you and, and you honor yeah. her and, and, you know, through her passing, good will come that people can learn and, and hopefully um, have better outcomes. But I credit you uh, for even just being a, a mom with, you know, a young child and the travel and the distance. And, you know, this is a, a topic that touches my heart in more ways than one. Um, you know, in full disclosure, I'm, I'm going through this with my mom right now. And I spent a few months... Um, helping my father as a caregiver and all of a sudden it takes one change or one diagnosis or or one visit to a doctor and your whole life could change and life becomes this regimentation of medications and doctor's appointments and then thinking about all the questions that you have to ask this doctor and you're given such a limited window and there's so much you want to say and so much you want to ask and so much that you want to know that it's hard to get that all out in one visit. When you take all of those complexities and you add to the fact that, you know, unless you, unless you're a physician, this is all Greek to you. I mean, if you haven't studied medicine, then for the most part, you're, you're at a huge disadvantage, and you're in a realm that you have no idea what you're discussing. So there's a there's an information gap, there's a knowledge gap there that is very hard to bridge. So the need for the need for an advocate is just so important. Um, I want to talk about something that you said, and I'm, I mean, again, another touches my heart. In full disclosure, I mean the love of my life as a physician and you know we talk about how you talk to doctors and, and you know it, it's they are you know they are very myopic and they see the world as they know it and they know so much they have such heightened knowledge that you know you're not at a level playing field when you're having these conversations so how do you begin that dialogue with at helping people advocate to communicate with their physicians It's a great question, and there are multiple things to consider. So number one is when you're an advocate for a patient, you don't have to have as much knowledge as a physician. So I want to put people's minds at ease that they don't have to have that level of education to have a worthwhile conversation and to gain the information that's important for their loved one. However, it does help you if you're knowledgeable about your loved one's disease and the medication they're taking. So really just focusing on what's most important versus all the other noise that surrounds the medical community, right? Well, how do you do that? So then back up one uh, step, and I'm sure you'll go there, is how do you, you know, how do you receive good information? How do you do good research on your loved one's illness? Because you start a Google search, and it's a scary place of where it can take you. And so much to decipher, you know, what is a trusted authority, what is not. So how do you arm yourself with that knowledge of your loved one's disease? Yes, so so important. And I have created a website called badassadvocate.com. It's a wonderful website. (laughs) Thank you. And on there... I have a tab that's called resources, and under there, there's tons of information of websites where you can go to get reliable information. So, number one, it's not worthwhile me rattling off those website addresses because it's kind of complicated, Yes, but that's one place you could go, and I give it to you because those are the websites that our medical directors over the years have used and given me to say, oh, here's where you can look up this article. So I'm sharing that. It's not private information. It's nothing to do with my company. It's public, and it's and they're government websites, but they're reliable. And it's I agree with you. Don't go do a Google search because you never know which website's going to give you valuable information or reliable versus misinformation. The other thing is websites like the CDC, WebMD. Those are reliable websites that you can go to and find actual valid information. So you just really have to be careful, and you can scare yourself and stress yourself out more. I will tell you, and since, and I'm sure you've heard this from the physician that that you're you're married. Is that who it is? No, my, my boyfriend. Yes, your boyfriend. Mm-hmm. Okay. So 
he would probably tell you this, but they don't love when patients come in or advocates come in and start saying, well, I found on Google. <laughs> um, so if you, but that being said, it's great to come in armed with good information. Mm-hmm. So if you use those websites and you can come and bring it, then that's being a team with the physician versus bringing in information that's a waste of their time and, you know, they have to re-explain everything. So you definitely want to work with them, not against them. Erin, I mean, as you know, the, the time spent face-to-face with your physician is, is shorter and shorter. Um, mm-hmm. just do, it's the way of the world. I mean, insurance companies, you know, they have to see more patients. They have to increase the volume, so shorter one-on-one time. So how do you make the most effective use of your time? How do you maximize the efficiency of that visit and prioritize your questions and your information while also giving the doctor a chance to do his or her job, how do you balance those interests? Yes, so this is really important, and especially as an advocate. So number one is you want to get together with your family or whoever's supporting that patient and brainstorm on questions before any meeting with a doctor. So if your loved one is hospitalized, then I would do that before rounds. The hospital that my sister was at, was, the rounds were in the morning at 7 a.m. So we made sure that we were prepared before the next morning, my mm-hmm. family. And it's great to come together because more, more than one brain is better, right? Yes. And the more people you have thinking about what could they ask. I mean, we all think differently. So let's use that to our advantage to support the patient. That's number one is brainstorming questions. Number two is writing them down, whether it's in your phone or on a piece of paper. I I advocate for the phone only because a piece of paper could get lost in Mm -hmm. my world. So my phone is always with me. And what we did as a family is we collected those questions, wrote them down in the notes app, and then had them handy for when the physician was there. That made our time so valuable because we got all the information we needed. We can tend to go off on tangents and go down the road that you didn't really intend to, but if you have a list of questions that are the most important things that you need to know, then you will get the information that's necessary. Erin, you also Mm -hmm. suggest recording the conversation. So you're saying, you know, again, I'm assuming using your phone. Yeah. So recording a visit. This was one of the best things that we did. And the number one caveat I'll give you here is make sure that you have the permission of the physician or whoever the medical staff member is, and the patient. So you need their permission because there are a lot of privacy laws. And this isn't to trip anyone up or to catch them doing something wrong. It's purely for advocating purposes and to support the patient. Well, sure, because you forget. I mean, you're overwhelmed. It's hard to process when you leave and then, you know, break down everything that you just heard, especially if you're being dealt information that's it's hard to hear it's hard to handle um oftentimes it's a surreal experience until you go home and you start to digest it so i it begs the need for a recorded conversation you have to go back and and kind of what did he say and and really absorb it kind of in a different space yeah the patient is overwhelmed sometimes the caregiver or the advocate is overwhelmed you may hear something and then your brain goes off thinking about what they just said, and they continue talking, and you miss it. Mm-hmm. When you record the conversation, like you said, you can go back and listen to it, and then anyone who's not there that's part of your core team, they can listen to it, as long as the patient is okay with that, which for my sister, it was my little immediate family, so her brother, my mom, and her husband. And so we were, we would go back and listen to it, and then even once down the, the road, if you need to go back and say, you know, the doctor said something six months ago, and I kind of forget Well, I have the recording. And that was an important conversation, and I didn't realize it until today that we needed that piece of information. So you can really use it in so many ways that I really advocate for that. I really recommend recording conversations as long as the physician is comfortable with it. And if they are not, then you should always have a notebook so you can take diligent notes, and that's something you can refer back to as well. 
So for those just joining us on 1460 WVOX or on Facebook Live, I'm speaking with Erin Gallion, and she is the author of Badass Advocate. And we're talking about being an advocate, a healthcare advocate for a loved one. And the importance of that can't be underscored, having a good person as your champion. So I want you, we're going to give all the information of your website and how they can buy the book, and it was a wonderful read. But you have these eight badass strategies. Can you share them with us? Because they're very useful tools in, navig- in navigating the journey as an advocate and caregiver. Absolutely. So the number one badass strategy that I show is building a support team. And I've sort of alluded to that already, which is getting people together, whether it's family, whether it's close friends. Obviously, you want the patient to weigh in because they will be spending time with these people and they will be involved in their their case. So build that support team, and that will help you to be stronger and to better advocate for that loved one. Now, Should there be a spokesperson, hard- though? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Should there be a spokesperson yes. that's specifically, like a point person that's designated? It's great to be surrounded by people, but should there be one designated a spokesperson for someone who's sick? Yes, and that typically happens. It's usually the spouse or an adult child or, um, you know, someone who's a very close immediate of the parent. Mm-hmm. Um, so that usually falls on the caregiver's shoulders. Now, what I mean by support team is you are there to also support that main caregiver, right? So the caregiver usually is the person who takes on all the day-to-day responsibilities and may become exhausted and overwhelmed. It's a lot to take care of. Yes. I mean, you just referenced your father, right? Was your mom's main, or is your mom's main caregiver? He is, yes. So, yeah, so that's a lot for him. And the way to support him and your mom at the same time is to take some of the smaller responsibilities off their shoulders. Mm-hmm. Things like organizing a meal train, handling donations, or maybe conducting the research. Someone like myself, I'm not always the best at conducting research, so if there's someone else on the support team that's really good at that and loves it, give that to them so they can relay the information to the team. So there's many ideas that I share in the book of how you can delegate responsibilities to lessen the stress and the day-to-day just overwhelming <laughs> responsibilities for that caregiver. So So that's that's number one. one. Yes, a great, a great team to surround you. Good advice for anything in life. Always be surrounded by good people. (laughs) Right. That's right. That's right. Um, Number two is be persistent and respectful. And that's about don't be afraid to give pushback to medical professionals. So there's a balance there, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to be persistent. Sometimes we put medical professionals on such a high pedestal that we're afraid to get pushed back, mm-hmm. but then there's the other extreme where we're under a very stressful situation where we're rude and aggressive, and there needs to be a healthy balance there. You're yes. working with them as a team. They're part of your support team, but more of an extended part of the support team, not the, one of the main members. Yes, I mean, and working together, you know, you're all on the same team, so mm-hmm. you know, sometimes you have to check emotions at the door, and I know it's difficult. It's an emotionally charged yeah. situation. Um And I, listen, that even trickles down to my line of work in in the funeral industry. You're just dealing with people at stressful times and someone bears the brunt of that. And it's usually that, that person, um, you know, working on the team. So yes, be persistent. If something doesn't sound right, you know, get your questions answered, but just keep this communication respectful. Um, wonderful tip. Um, I want to make sure that we're covering this. So I'm going to move on to number three, which is. Ask strong question. So this goes back to what I was talking about as a pharmaceutical sales trainer. This is a, one thing that I teach reps how to do is asking good questions. And I talk about asking open-ended questions to get the physician talking. You want to come prepared like I talked about earlier, brainstorm before the meeting, and then ask a lot of open-ended questions, the what, how, when questions to get as much information that you can out of the physician. Okay, and it pointed direct, I mean, questions, open-ended, but, you know, questions that are meaningful, that are going to yield yeah. meaningful, thoughtful answers. Um, they need to be specific, yeah. So yes. you get the information you need, and you don't walk away with a bunch of information that's not relevant. Right, right, right. Okay, moving on. That great tip so far. Number four, I and guess? Sure. Yeah, that strategy number four is the recording the conversations, correct okay. forgetfulness. 
So I don't know about you, but I have a terrible memory. So that really helps. I've, I've already given you why it helps in so many different ways, but also just because we forget too. You can't remember everything that's said in the conversation. And you know what? I think, you know, I always prided myself that I have this memory of an elephant, but you can see like, you know, the older you get and then the more stress you get, you know, all the stuff that weighs on your mind, it starts to chip away at that. So I'm not quite the elephant that I used to be, but it's true. Like, <laughs> you know, you forget, like you have all these things to say. And, and I remember, you know, I've, I've been telling my dad each week, like we have to write down these questions and it's so easy to forget. Right. You know, you are so emotional and it's hard to balance logic and emotions during this time. So yes, recording the conversation, number five, I guess. Number five is gain and apply powerful knowledge. So this has to do with research, and I give you a lot of advice in the book on how to do that and just applying that to the questions and the conversations that you have, and also when it just comes to advocating, right? So it's not just about conversations with physicians. If your loved one is in the hospital or if they're in home care, you know, and you're visiting them, I know it's really different now with COVID-19, or if they're even at home, you need to take care of them, right? You might not always have a nurse next to next to them. And even if they're in the hospital, they're not always in the room. So you need to be knowledgeable enough that you can look out for them and pay attention to signs that may be dangerous. And it's, you know, even more so, sometimes a home setting can create more hazards and harm than the hospital setting. Yeah. So, you know, all the... Yes, and even just people that are in the home. I mean, that's, you know, your mm -hmm. personal belongings are there, you know, jewelry, cash, checkbooks, you know, personal belongings. Um, mm -hmm. With a vulnerable person, sometimes that could be the recipe, you know, for a bad situation. So advocacy and home care is so important, especially for the vetting process of who's being allowed mm -hmm. into the closest parts of a person. So wonderful, wonderful tip right there, Erin. Yeah, and, and that our strategy number six is be the patient's champion. Really just looking out for them uh, when taking care of them. So, you know, my sister would love to have her feet rubbed. And just little things you can do to put their mind at ease. You know, it's an emotional roller coaster for them. And, you know, this whole conversation, you and I have talked about advocating for them and speaking to the doctor and the nurses. But, and that happens where sometimes we actually feel about the patient. Yes. And what yes. they're going through emotionally. And, you know, if I could go back, I, that is, is one, not even regret because we... I, I helped my sister emotionally, but not to the degree that I'm, I know about now. And what I'm aware of, actually, from researching for this book, too, about how emotionally the patient's really suffering. And you need to check in with them and take care of them and their heart as much as possible. It's true. You can't forget about the person. You know, the disease can't define the person. So that is a wonderful mm -hmm. tip right there. Yeah. And then number seven is avoid caregiver's fatigue. So caregiver's fatigue is an actual medical term. Mm -hmm. And it's someone, like if you think about your father, someone like him who's taking care of someone day in and day out, and they get worn out. It is a very stressful time. And how do we help them avoid that burnout? And so I kind of reference that, and it's something to be aware of, especially if you are that main caregiver, because you don't want that to happen. Oh, very true. And your final badass strategy for our listeners and viewers? Yeah, so I came up with this idea of, it's called the five R's. And the five R's are reflect, review, re-examine, re, re and recharge. It's a daily way to kind of keep organized, to keep your mind at ease, to make sure that you are hitting all of the points, doing all the things you need. I realized when I wrote this book and I was sharing the lessons that I've learned, it can be overwhelming. And I, that's the last thing I want to do is overwhelm someone who's already overwhelmed. My goal is to help decrease that feeling, right? So, so I came up with this system. If you wake up in the morning, I'm not only a morning person, but I feel like if you can wake up 30 minutes early to do this, it could change your day and help to decrease the stress, yeah. and which is really one of my goals. Makes a ton of sense. Erin, as I suspected, um, the subject matter we're covering has taken up so much time and we can go on so much more. I really would like to have you back, but can you give everyone your website? Because I encourage everyone to stop and take a look at that today to get the book. And you have wonderful resources. So where can you Thank be you. found? 
Yes. So my website is www.badassadvocate. So badass is one word. dot com. I, I so love the easy, title. Like the book. <laughs> badass Thank advocate. You. And, and again, you have to be really a strong badass to champion causes for your loved ones. Speaking for those who can't speak for themselves, mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a wonderful thing. Um, you have to speak up for yourself in this world and fight for yourself, but you also have to fight for the people that you love who can't do it. And yeah. um, asking the right questions, having the right conversations, effective communication um, is only going to yield better results. I know you've been through so much in your life, but you've really channeled it in such an amazingly positive way. I give you so much credit. And having read the book and seen the website myself, I guarantee that this is a wonderful resource. I encourage everyone to go to badassadvocate.com. You have resources, too, for every step of the journey on there, Erin, you know, be, during the illness or even in the aftermath. So please take a look and purchase the book. Erin, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jen. This was so much fun. And uh, we will speak to you again. And this is Jen Graziano thanking you for taking the time to listen as we took the time to talk. Have a great day, Westchester. Bye-bye.